Microwaves aren't very energetic. They have a wavelength between 1 millimeter and 30 centimeters, which is really big compared to the things we've seen so far. It also means their frequencies are really small. But they're very important waves. And for molecules, that's just enough energy for them to rotate and vibrate. And it turns out that 2,450 megahertz is enough energy to cause water molecules to vibrate and rotate. And that causes them to heat up. Pasta. Nice and hot. So the uh, microwaves that are in our microwave ovens cause water molecules to heat up, move around, and get really warm. Let's find another use for microwaves. Mm. Pasta. I got one more question for you, Larry. OK. So uh, you know, I was making some lunch. Used a microwave oven, and I thought, hey, there's got to be another use for these microwaves. Ooh, microwaves. Yes. I love microwaves. Oh, I yes. use them every day just like you do. Yep. It was a good but lunch. But they're also useful in astronomy. Yeah, so. And starting the universe. So, what, so what do they tell us? These are all images from microwave uh, receivers and radio receivers. Right. And what they do is they visualize the invisible light in microwaves. Now, I think it's kind of neat because you told us about gamma rays and you told us about x-rays and now we're learning about some microwaves. Each one gives us a different picture of what's going on at the same place. So yeah. if we looked at this, not in the, not in the uh, microwave like we are now, but like in the x-ray or in the gamma ray, would we see a different picture? It probably would be invisible mm -hmm. in all the other wavelengths. So sometimes, like in this case, radio waves and, and microwaves are the best way to look at it. But sometimes, like over here, you notice that you need to have a visible light picture mm -hmm. and the microwaves and radio waves coming out to see those jets. You mm. don't see them at all in visible light. You've been such a huge help. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I think we're out of questions. Thank okay. you so much. Well, if you have any more, come on back. Love the ad. We'll be back okay. here. Okay. Thank you very much for coming here. Take care now. Okay. Bye-bye. Now we're at the radio portion of the spectrum. And as far as waves are concerned, they have the longest wavelengths, the smallest frequencies, and the lowest energies. That makes them really easy to make, and we've come to rely on them for things like communication. We use them in our homes, car radios, cell phones, televisions, wireless internet connections, or Wi-Fi. Most of us were using radio frequency without even knowing it. Every time you turn a dial on the radio, you're turning the frequency. My favorite radio station is WXRT, which has a frequency of 93.1 megahertz. Megahertz is 10 to the 6th hertz, or 1 million hertz. But as far as most people are concerned, one of the best uses for radio communication is... Sorry, one second. The cell phone. Hello? Oh, hi. Yeah. No, I'm wearing my blue lab coat. What are you wearing? Okay. Yeah, I'll pick them up. I promise. Okay, bye. You know, you shouldn't be talking on that and driving. <laughs> you know what, you're right. I'll turn it off, but we're here. Where are we? We're at Motorola. Why? Because that's where the cellular telephone was marketed and developed, and it's all on the radio frequency, so I think we should go check it out. Cool. Yeah? yeah, let's go. Looks like you've got a lot of cell phones out here, and those don't look very new. Nope, these are part of history. So back in 1973, the first phone call on a present-day cellular system was made by a Motorola, Dr. Martin Cooper, uh, in New York with a phone that looked something like this. And today, you have lots of options. This looks like an interesting one. What's, what's special that about this That is phone? the Renew. That is the world's first carbon-free phone. It's made with recycled paper, recycled plastics, and uh, for the ecology and climate-minded. Wow. So it's okay. better for the environment? It's better, better for the environment. Hi, Bruce. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. This is my friend Christina here. Hi. Christina, nice how to are meet you. you. We saw some of the cell phones, but it looks yeah. like Motorola dabbles in some other things, too. Yes. Uh, these are two-way radios oh, and yeah. uh, uh, products that are designed for uh, enterprise workers. Okay. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, actually defines what frequencies uh, radios can operate on and what services they can operate on. So they only allow police agencies to operate on certain frequencies. They only allow uh, the, the federal FBI government agencies to operate on certain frequencies. And also businesses, if I'm a taxi cab, a, a, uh, 
a Walmart or something can only operate on certain frequencies. So now that keeps uh, these two uh, users from uh, stepping on each other each or conversation. hearing each other's <laughs> yeah. conversations. Wow, well thank you very much for showing us these. You're welcome. And we had a great time. Thank you very much. All right, we'll see you around. Thank Take you. care now. That is pretty cool. I have always been through life with a cell phone. Have you? Yeah. Hmm. Guess I'm a little bit older. They're kind of new to me. <laughs> so radio is mostly used for communication? Yes, it's a great region of the spectrum for that. But there's some more you can do. You can actually do some exploring in the radio. Really? How? Well, some students at DePaul built a radio telescope. Cool. We built this little telescope here to look at uh, radio signals coming from the sun, radio signals coming from Jupiter, and radio signals coming from the Milky Way. We tuned to a very specific frequency, a very specific color of radio. Um, that uh, is most prevalent coming from the sun and coming from Jupiter. But we did catch noise. We did catch radio noise here. When I mean noise now, it's not things that you hear. I meant uh, interference that's not coming from the sources you one wants to study, for instance, the sun and Jupiter in our case. And that's something one has to deal with in science. The light that's hitting our antenna doesn't know it's not supposed to hit our antenna if it's not coming from Jupiter and, and sun. And one then has to do various kinds of things with the data to try to minimize the noise and try to extract from it the real information one is looking for. The physical setup of the radio telescope, you have eight PVC pipes, and they're really tall, I think about 15 feet tall. And then you have these lines of wire, which like I said, the wire is used to uh, receive the signal because it aligns the electrons. And then it comes together. So you have your PVC pipes, they're like this. You have the wire coming across here and the wire in the middle comes together to a line, and it goes down and it attaches to um, like a receiver, and then that converts it to a signal we can read. The antenna then simply picks up the, the wavelength, the redder than red light, and converts it to an electrical signal, which we then, with software, convert it to numbers that we can then visualize those numbers, and we can see that the sun, for instance, is especially radio loud today, or Jupiter is radio loud today. And then one tries to understand what kinds of physical processes would have caused the Sun or Jupiter to have been especially active in the radio that particular day. And to understand what's going on in the entire universe, we, we need all the frequencies of light. Unfortunately, no single instrument can capture all the colors. So we, different instruments are designed for different wavelength ranges. And the radio, of course, is designed to pick up color radio. So what'd you think? That was so awesome. Seriously, I didn't know that there was so much to see that I can't even see. It was pretty cool, huh? Oh, yeah. So, what are you going to do with those? I know they don't work, and I know why they don't work. Still, I'd like to hang on to them. Oh, you should. I think they look good on you. Okay. Well, I'm going to run. Okay. I'll see you in the visible. As if you had a choice. I know. IR would be so cool. When you think about it, our eyes can only see a very narrow portion of the spectrum. So it's very impressive that there's so much out there that we can't even see. I encourage you to visit the Adler Planetarium and learn more about the different parts of the spectrum and what they tell us about the universe in terms of its past, its present, and its future. Every time we switch scenes today, we used an image of our galaxy from a different portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So go to the Adler Planetarium and see what we can learn from the skies above. <laughs> see a thing.